Hi, this is our second video on chapter two about organizing data and misleading statistics covering sections 2.3 and 2.4. A few definitions to start with. First, the class midpoint. So remember, classes are how we organize our data and the class midpoint Again, the formal definition is that it's the sum of consecutive lower class limits divided by two, or basically the average of two consecutive lower class limits, but its name is pretty descriptive in that it's, again, the midpoint of our class. What would that middle value be? Now, what we're going to be taking a look at today is frequency polygons, which are more commonly referred to as line graphs, but my stat lab and Pearson likes to call them frequency poly polygons, which is accurate. And basically, it's just a graph that uses points connected by lines to represent the frequencies for our classes. And we make them simply by finding our class midpoint and plotting the frequency of that class at the class midpoint and then connecting the dots. Now, for your textbook, they do state that you should connect the last two, the first frequency and the last frequency, the two endpoints, back down to the horizontal axis, back down to zero. Now, this is accurate. It's not necessarily the standard, and you're gonna see that not every graph connects it to the x-axis at the end anyway. Um, sometimes that can look a little cluttered, but that is the convention here with this textbook, so that's the convention we're going to follow. Now, the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna take a look at the example from the last video, example three about the Baseball Hall of Fame pitchers and how many games they played in. And so, since I want to graph now with the class midpoint, I better find those class midpoints. So the class midpoint, like I said, is gonna be basically the average of those two consecutive classes. So my first class midpoint is gonna be the average of 670 and 680, or right again, that what's gonna be right in the middle which in this case will work what's right between 670 and 680, 675. And because we picked our class width as 10, each class midpoint will then increase by 10. So 675, 685, 695, and so on. Now we're gonna create our line graph or our frequency polygon. And here it is. Again, if you look, 675 had a frequency of two, so we plotted the point there. 685 had a frequency of zero. So again, we plotted the frequency there and we just connected it all with lines. Now, what you're gonna notice is this frequency polygon or this line graph is representing the same exact data that our histogram did. And in fact, when I graph the two on top of each other, it's almost exactly the same. And so it really just depends on, well, which visualization you think would get your point across better sometimes. Um, or just which one you find more aesthetically pleasing. Now, a few more definitions before the next part. So ordered quantitative data, again, data that's numbers and has to be in a specific order, can be summarized using cumulative distributions. And these are actually really, really important in a lot of aspects of doing statistics, um, where what we're doing with that cumulative data is we're actually looking at the aggregate. And again, the aggregate just means we're combining several different measurements. And so the cumulative frequency distribution, or CDF, displays that aggregate frequency. And essentially what we do is we're gonna add up our relative frequencies with our cumulative relative frequency distribution as we continue on through the graph. All right, using the upper class limit for our continuous data. And so let's take a look at what that's going to look like and what that is called. Because we actually have a specific name for this type of graph. If we do it as a line graph, this is called an ogive. And again, it's just the cumulative relative frequency in the form of a line graph, which again, we're connecting our line segments. Now in this case, it does make sense to make sure we connect to the horizontal axis on that left-hand side, because we should always start at 0%. But let's go through the table first and then we'll take a look at the graph. All right, so in this case, again, I'm looking at that same table. Now, notice that I don't want the class midpoint. I want the upper limit of each class because that's gonna be where I, I draw my graph now. And now we're gonna do the cumulative relative frequencies, which means we're basically gonna go through the table and add up as we go. So we're going to start with the first relative frequency 
which is the 0 0.044. And, well, that's all we have so far. So my cumulative relative frequency is 0 0.044. Now, for the next line, we're going to add the next relative frequency. Now, the next relative frequency is 0. So, well, if I add 0, that's not going to change anything. So my next cumulative relative frequency is well, the exact same. And we're going to continue that process. So the next cumulative relative frequency is I take the next relative frequency there, the 0.1556, and again, I'm going to add that to what I have already gotten to with my cumulative relative frequency. When I add those two together, I get 0.2. Now for the next step, again, add the next value with what we're at currently, and 0.2 plus 0.2 is 0.4. The next one is, well, 0.2 plus 0.4, so 0.6, then 0.244 plus 0.6, so 0.844, and then when we add the last one, we get to 1, because again, it always needs to add up to 1. What I've done is add every single one of my relative frequencies, and that always, always, always has got to add to 1. And if I plot that, well, here's my, my ogive. Again, notice that we absolutely do want to connect it to the horizontal axis there at zero. And also notice that at the top, it's going to hit one and it will always, always stay at one because one is, well, 100%. It's 100% of my data. Next set of definitions. So where we frequently see our line graphs or our frequency polygons is particularly when we're looking at what is called time series data, or when we're looking at data that, well, we're looking at what happens over a set period of time. So again, this should feel fairly intuitive, so we'll just look at a quick example. And so let's say I have the following data showing the closing prices of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, or you know, the stock market. Uh, from 1990 to 2007. And so, again, the raw data would be that table. And again, that table is really nice because it's perfectly accurate and we can look at exactly what those values are. But if I'm trying to make conclusions about overall trends, that visualization on the right, that graph looks much, much better. And again, a lot of times the best way to use data is to actually have both sets so that you can look at the visualization and I can look at that visualization and I can see, well, it looks like over that 17 year period, basically the stock market just kept going up. Now, although it uh, trended up overall, well, we can also see that right around here, there must've been a dip starting at right here, the end of the year uh, after 2000, going from 2000 to 2001, we had a dip. Well, now we can start looking at, well, how big was that dip? And we can look at the table and we can also try to discern, well, why might that have happened? Well, what happened in 2001? Well, September 11th happened in 2001 and caused the world's financial markets to um, well, take quite a hit. And so you see that trend even continued into 2002. And, but after that, it righted itself and started increasing again. Now, if I included the next year at the end here, instead of stopping at 2007, we'd see 2008 was the housing market crisis, which caused another drop. But again, it seems to be the trend over well, the last few decades that, yeah, they, we have these dips, but overall, it just seems to keep going up and up and up. And uh, even if you might suffer temporary losses, well, the stock market always seems to be able to fix itself eventually. But now let's talk about probably the most important part of this class, uh, or at least the, the, the part that I hope you take away from this class and, and keep in the back of your mind for the rest of your life as you listen to the news or media or see pictures online or graphs. And that's because these graphs and these statistics can be incredibly misleading. Uh, I mean, first of all, experts can come to different conclusions based on the same data set because some of it is subjective, as we'll see. But more commonly, you just want to be careful because experts or just deceitful people can actually use graphs and numerical summaries to simply point out the conclusion that they want. Instead of trying to use the data to come to a conclusion, they will have a conclusion. They have an agenda ahead of time 
and they will make sure that that data represents the conclusion that they want. And statistics is, well, unfortunately, very much prone to this because everyone has an agenda. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're out to get you because well, realistically, almost nobody's out to get you, but they are out for themselves. And well, when they're out for themselves, they're gonna do what benefits them, not necessarily anybody else. Um, and it also leads to, well, one of my favorite quotes, and this is from Mark Twain, although he paraphrased it from an even earlier source. It said, there are lies, meaning there are, you know, the little white lies we tell every day. There are damn lies, which are the, the huge, just egregious lies that are told from time to time. And then there's statistics, where statistics is true, right? The data set will be true. People will use absolutely 100% accurate data and 100% accurate statistics, but they're going to use it in a way that is a bit deceitful, in a way that's going to make you come to a, the, a conclusion that they want you to come to. Now let's take a look at the most common way that people do that. And so in this example, I took the life expectancies of people in the United States from 1950 to 2010 using the uh, CDC website uh, from our federal government. And so you can see that in the year 1950, the life expectancy was 68.2 years and, and so on. And so what I'm gonna do is make a graph of this data. Although actually I'm gonna make two different graphs. And both of these graphs that you're gonna see on the next slide are 100% accurate, however, they look a little bit different. Again, both of these graphs are perfectly accurate. Both of these graphs, I used the exact data from that table and I made my graphs. But clearly there's a big difference here. If you look at that one on the left, graph A, it seems like the, the life expectancy has increased dramatically. It seems like we're leading incredibly longer lives as Americans. And the graph on the right though, well, we can definitely see that it's trending upwards, but it doesn't look like it's nearly that big of a change, does it? Now, where would misleading statistics come in? Both of these are accurate. You're not telling a lie at all with either one of these graphs. Both of these graphs are 100% accurate. However, if you notice that graph on the left, well, it starts at, 68. It already starts at the years at the age of 68 years old. Well, is that a good place to start the graph? Typically not. Typically, we want to start at zero. Typically, we want to start at zero. Now, if you were working in, say, the healthcare industry and you were a lobbyist trying to tell congressmen that there's no need to change anything about the healthcare system in America because it's working really well you'd probably use that first graph because look at that. The, the healthcare in America is so great that life expectancy has gotten dramatically, dramatically longer over the last few decades. But, but is it, is it misleading? And I think it probably is a little bit. Now, that's not to say there aren't good things where the life expectancy has gone up and, and hopefully it'll continue to go up. Um, I am a little nervous, you know, when I see the 2020 data, uh, but uh, for now, yeah, that's, it's still going up, but not nearly as dramatically. And again, just be very cautious. Anytime you see a graph, the first thing you should look for is the scale, that Y axis, that vertical axis, where are we starting and ending? And is that really the most accurate place to start and end? Now, some quick guidelines for good graphs. First, you have to title and label everything. All right, every single axis should have a title and should be labeled. All right, you need to include your keys, your units of measurements, and you should always include a data source. Also, avoid distortion. You should never lie about the data. Again, there will be selfish people who do. That shouldn't be you. You also want to try to typically minimize the amount of white space. You want to actually be able to kind of tell your story using the space you have. All right. And if you do have to scale 
your y-axis that way, make sure that it is clearly indicated to who's ever going to be looking at your statistics. Also, try to avoid clutter as much as possible. Don't put excessive grid lines or unnecessary backgrounds or add pictures. Don't try to distract the reader. And you'll see that shows up quite commonly too. People try to make their infographics look fancy, but it ends up just, well, distracting from the actual data underneath. Also, typically try to avoid three dimensions. I mean, three dimensional charts, they look nice, but again, they could be distracting. And because of the three dimensions, they can kind of stretch and skew the data to not be as accurate as it should be. Also, typically you want to only use one design in your graphic. Um, sometimes you'll see people try to combine a whole bunch of things and pie charts and histograms and line graphs and everything together. And no, just step back. Don't try to force the reader to any specific part of the graph. Don't try to force your conclusion on the data or on the reader, I'm sorry. Let that data speak for itself. And of course, avoid any graphs that don't have data or scales. Now, this is also kind of an interesting part where I'd like to take just a few minutes to talk about some of the historical aspects of statistics and graphs. And so I wanna talk about the historical figure, Florence Nightingale. Now, when most people hear Florence Nightingale, they think, well, that lady with the lamp. She's commonly known as one of the most famous nurses in history because she was the first person to really recognize the importance of professionally training our nurses and that they should be trained in medical procedures and actually go to school instead of just, well, taking women from their houses and putting them on the battlefield, which was what was being done at the time. And she used her experiences in the battlefields, uh, being a British nurse during the Crimea Wars, to actually establish one of the first professional nursing schools back in 1860. Now, although she is a famous nurse and she should be remembered for that, she is also one of the first people that realized that visualizing data and creating graphs is going to be the most efficient way to get your point across. Because while she was on the battlefield, she constantly was recording data on the soldiers and she was sending all this data to the brass back in England about well, what was going on in the field. Except the top brass of the British military didn't really know how to understand the data. They saw all these numbers and said, okay, well, numbers, all right, I guess, okay, it's just numbers. And Florence Nightingale realized that to get through to them, to explain to the top heads of the British military what was going on, she was going to have to do something different. She'd need to gain their attention visually. And so I want to share just a few of the graphs that she personally created and shared with the heads of the British military, which ended up leading to significant changes in how battlefield nursing ended up being administered. So this first one is a side-by-side -side bar graph that she, that she created, where she compared the death rates for typical Englishmen with the actual foot soldiers going to war based on their ages. Um, and again, that was one of the first times someone used a side-by-side -side bar graph like that. She also created nice line graphs where, again, we're talking about uh, mortality rates of young soldiers and veterans and the population as a whole and what's going on and, and, and what are they dying of. And then my personal favorite, she actually turned a pie graph into this really nice infographic where you can see month by month what is the mortality rate of the soldiers and most importantly what are they dying of are they dying of actual are they dying in battle are they dying afterward from their injuries or are they dying from disease that is spreading around these camps and by visualizing the data this way and sending it to the military they were able to realize what was going on and, and actually put in preventative measures to stop soldiers from just dying of disease from, well, being in close proximity to each other. And Florence Nightingale is one of the, I guess, founders, one of the, the original people who was able to understand that statistics viewed visually is, well, one of the best ways to get your point across. Well, that's it for this video. Um, hopefully it was informative. If you have any questions on your homework, please let me know.